Hello, good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from the world today. Thank you for joining us in the fourth annual Sense Nano Symposium, the body at all scales. My name is Brian Anthony. I'm the Associate Director of MIT Nano, and I'll be your host through our journey in learning about sensors and sensing systems. Sense.nano is the first center of excellence powered by MIT Nano. Our focus on sensors and instrumentation and sensing systems and sensing techniques. Our research in sensing science, sensing engineering, leads to groundbreaking innovations in healthcare, biology, environmental remediation, smart manufacturing, and the creation of advanced materials and technologies. The symposium is sponsored by MIT Nano, by the Institute for Medical Engineering and Science, the Clinical Research Center at MIT, and the Industrial Liaison Program. When we talk about sense, we talk about three topical areas, sensors, sensing systems, and sensing techniques. Some examples are included here. Sensors, such as a, a Velcro series of micro needles that can, in a non-destructive way, penetrate through plastic packaging to characterize if there is spoilage. Or a sensing system, such as is worn by a, a human, to pick up their non-verbal slight motions of the jaw or the way that they tilt their head to pick up nonverbal communications so that we don't have to speak to our phone. We can maybe internally speak to our phone. Or sensing techniques such as embedding, coding a nanoparticle uh, with, with technologies or with chemicals that will interact with tumors in the body. And then when passed through the body can be retrieved to characterize the presence of a tumor or whether the tumor has been dealt with and eliminated from the body through therapies and treatment. Let's put Sense Nano in context. In this era of big data, we may forget that data are derived from sensors and instruments, from wearable and non-wearable, non-contact physiological monitors, from environmental sensors, from our interaction with our devices. Sensors and sensing systems are in our homes, in our vehicles, in medical devices, and our clothing. Sensors help medical professionals determine if we are sick. Sensors detect our interaction with the environment, each other for contact tracing, and help to shape our understanding of the world and hopefully to get us back to a, a new normal. New manufacturing technologies facilitate the at-scale creation of new devices and systems. Integrated photonics manufacturing allows us to integrate electronics and photonics onto singular substrates. New fiber manufacturing technologies allows us to approach embedding sensors into our clothing. Flexible electronics manufacturing is used to create conformal systems that are form fit to the body or to seats in our homes, in our cars, making sensory surfaces out of everyday objects. These innovative manufacturing technologies enable us to realize at scale novel sensors, sensing systems and sensing approaches. MIT Nano is a shared facility on MIT's campus that supports all of our researchers on campus, off campus, partners from academia and industry in the creation of novel materials, novel processes, novel devices. MIT Nano provides resources, people and tools for fabrication. MIT Nano will provide resources, people and tools for characterization, for measurement and metrology. The immersion lab in MIT Nano serves to help create hardware and software tools for the interaction with and visualization of complex data. I'd like to introduce Vladimir Bulovic, the founding director of MIT Nano to offer his welcome for the day. It is an honor to welcome you on behalf of MIT Nano. 
This is a fourth year that we are holding Sense of Nano Conference, realizing just a tremendous opportunity that sensing technology gives to the world and the new sensing technologies that will be enabled by the dramatic advancements in nanoscience and nanotechnology, enabled by facilities like MIT Nano, but permeating throughout MIT campus and the world at large. Body as an ecosystem through which uh, to embed the sensing technology is a tremendous opportunity, clearly from perspective of health and human well-being, as Brian just described, but just from the perspective of also being able to truly understand how do we function down to the level of nanoscale, and how can the sensing technology hence inform us to deliver better medicines, better therapies, solutions that will indeed improve all of our lives. That being said, I will stop and just welcome you one more time. Thank you so much for joining us for today, tomorrow, and next week as we show you a variety of options, a variety of opportunities that the future is about to bring to us. Dr. Brian Anthony, please take over. Vladimir, thank you very much for sharing your welcome and helping us to excite our community for the day. We've organized the symposium in the scales of life. Sensors and sensing systems are an enabling technology for science and medicine. Sensors and sensing systems measure your vital signs, map your movements, and are used to examine your cells or your voice. Sense is how we observe, explain, and care for life. For this symposium, we have convened technical, business, and societal leaders from MIT, from industry, and beyond. You will hear technical talks, presentations by MIT launched startups, student presented sneak peeks and panel discussions. We provide the needs context and solution perspectives in the domains of sensing for the study of biology and the care of humans in their natural environments. We will highlight the needs for new sensing technologies, showcase research and innovations and present the impact of these technologies. We organize our discussions along the many scales of life. Cells, organs, organisms, the body, and populations, and the impact on our governments, financials, and social systems. I'd like to offer my severe, my, my thanks and appreciation to Elazar Edelman, who will join us today offering the keynote, framing our discussion and sharing his words of wisdom from a perspective of both an engineer and a clinician. Elazar, Dr. Edelman, is the director of the Institute for Medical Engineering and Science. He'll be sharing with us today his perspective on materials, medicine, health, sensing the world, sensing the world around us at all scales. With that, Professor Edelman, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Anthony. And um, thank you as well, uh, Professor Bolovic, not only for inviting me, but for putting this incredible symposium together and, and frankly for establishing uh, this incredible facility for all of us at MIT and the greater Boston area. What I'm gonna talk about, as you heard from um, Dr. Anthony, is how this marriage between medicine and science, engineering, technology at all scales has actually changed our lives. Just a word, about this remarkable place that we live in. It, it is a home for, for MIT, for 51 major universities and colleges, for 18 major hospitals, and for an incredible array of impactful uh, industries, startup and established. A word about IMES. IMES is an institute at MIT. That means that it is a horizontal strut within the landscape, the weave of MIT, which is principally supported by schools. In MIT, um, um, the institutes provide resources across disciplines. 
IMES, IMES' mission is to pioneer novel research paradigms and graduate curricula at this interface that we've been talking about, engineering science and medicine, to advance science, human science and health, and frankly, to educate future leaders. And IMES reaches out to the medical schools, to the hospitals at Harvard and Tufts as this fiber that runs through. We have a community of some 1,100 faculty, researchers, and staff dedicated to this message. We have over 2,000 alumni. And the goal of our institution is to create a cohesive community within MIT and its affiliates and to participate in this remarkable time within this remarkable place. What I want to start, what I want to use as a springboard for my talk is the idea that in our lifetimes, mortality from cardiovascular diseases has dropped precipitously. And you see it here on this incredible drop in heart diseases and in stroke. There's even been some advancement in cancer, but, but for a cardiologist like I am, this is a remarkable time. It's also a remarkable time because of this map this map, which is the most recent USA outbreak of confirm, confirmed new COVID infections per 100,000 people. So on the one hand, we have decreased disease from cardiovascular uh, illnesses. On the other, we've been confronted with an entirely new set of problems. And so I'm gonna start with a patient who's gonna run through our entire course uh, of my discussion, a patient I recently took care of who suffers from both. He has high blood pressure, diabetes, mild renal failure, he smokes, and for three days he had a prodromal illness, a viral prodromal illness, and he presented to our hospital with this electrocardiogram, which for the initiated is this horrifically worrisome EKG with these what we call tombstone elevation in his SD segments, which is reflective of an acute myocardial infarction, a heart attack. He's taken to an outlying hospital. In that hospital, they take him to the catheterization laboratory. And this is an angiogram, and the dye should extend all the way down and wrap around his heart, and it stops right there, and it's occluded with clot. And what's unusual about his heart is that the two major arteries that supply his heart are both clotted. They put in stents, parenthetically, that we helped invent, develop, Evroma saluting stents, and he's fine, and he goes to the recovery room, but he comes back within 45 minutes, or he within 45 minutes, he has a recurrence of his chest discomfort, a recurrence of his, um, his uh, EKG, and he's taken to the catheterization laboratory, and I don't know if you can see it, but his arteries are clotted again. He's sent to our, our hospital, and he's noted to have clot in all of his veins as well. This is an extraordinarily unusual case. He has two COVID tests where they're negative, and then finally, a third COVID test, which is positive. Now, what's remarkable about this case is that in every aspect, appreciation that he has clot, his electrocardiogram, his angiogram, the development of stents, the emergence of, of shock, and the placement of a left ventricular assist, a mechanical device, and finally, the testing for COVID have all been affected, impacted, developed, and made better by this marriage between IMES and MIT Nano. We've touched on every phase of this. So let's start at the beginning, because my kids think I was a colleague of Leonardo. We might as well start. This is the University of Padua. Leonardo is famous for this homunculus, but really what we don't appreciate was that in his time, he actually did things like particle velocity symmetry, where he looked at the eddies, not only in sewers and in rivers, he actually was the first to define the course of the coronary arteries, the arteries that supply the heart, and the aortic valve, the valve that sits between the heart and the rest of the body. And it actually created glass models of the heart and the aorta, threw in blades of grass, and looked today 
at particle, or he looked at his day, at how particles swirl and create tertiary and quaternary flows. Now today, link with investigators at IME and MIT Nano, we've done somewhat of the same thing. 400 years later, we can provide great insight into how blood flows through the cardiovascular system. But the truth is, what we've done is to be able to take one man's intuition 400 years ago and create it as a universal resource today. Da Vinci's work elicited no public change in thinking, principally because he just wrote his work in notebooks. He hid it. That's for another discussion. A hundred years later, this man, Sir William Harvey, went to the same school, the University of Padua. It was the MIT of its day. It's where people went throughout the world. And what he did, and this is from his work, the Motu Cordis, is he proved using mathematical precepts that blood does not flow through the arteries the way people had appreciated. He actually calculated in drams and scruples and ounces blood flow. Today, the work of Brian Anthony allows us to move beyond that really arduous and very difficult way of thinking to have non-invasive means of checking what took Harvey two years and for which his calculation was remarkably close, but also remarkably in this day far from what the total actual currents are. He estimated that our cardiac output, the amount of blood flow from our heart, was about a half to one liter per minute. Indeed, it's about five. And Brian's work will allow us to do it without the incredibly invasive, arduous kinds of work that Harvey had to do. Harvey was 1603, 1604. He published his work in 1628. And it too had no effect. Science in a vacuum, if you keep it to yourself, or science that cannot be illustrated to the world cannot have impact. It took literally another almost 200 years for anyone to appreciate that what Da Vinci and Harvey had actually shown had any clear clinical relevance. This man, this man, William Heberden, published in 1772, the first account of a disease that our gentleman had, chest pain, which he amply called angina pectoris, which means in Latin or Italian, chest pain. Today, angina pectoris and these symptoms that first, this is the first person, a friend of, of Heberden to have this disease. What we now associate is peculiar symptoms considerable for the kind of danger of which not, he said he didn't re recollect anyone ever publishing it. The seat and sense of strangling and anxiety may make it not properly called angina pectoris. Now, Heberden was a remarkable man, a disease for which the anatomy was defined in 1500 only becomes a disease in 1801. Today, we wouldn't do things that way. People like Roger Mark at MIT have developed our ability to now query thousands of records so that the clinical investigation of today is not one man talking about another person, one person one human talking about another. But Roger Mark, what MIT, what hospitals like the Beth Israel Deaconess with Phillips has allowed us to do is to create these incredibly powerful databases from which we can now query virtually instantly 13 terabytes, thousands of records of physiologic signals, high resolution clinical data, and images initially, which were chest x rays, are now accessed through MIT, through IMS, through HST, 90,000 monthly users. There are over 275 research publications per month that use PhysioNet and MIMIC electronic databases that allow us to fundamentally change how we query the world around us. Now, Hebronin was a remarkable man. He founded 
the Royal uh, College of uh, Physicians. He wrote one of the first textbooks. His student was Jenner. And with Benjamin Franklin, he introduced smallpox inoculation in the United States. It's particularly important today because MIT investigators are at the forefront of combating infectious diseases. It was Heberden who encouraged Jenner to make inoculation wholesalely available. They were mocked in their day. This is a cartoon of the day which show cowpox, which was used, they would inject beneath the skin elements of cowpox, a much less virulent disease to ward off against this terrible smallpox. And you see here illustrations in the press of people growing cows out of their arms and growing horns out of their head. IMES, MIT, NANO are led by incredible people who are contributing to our battle against COVID. Bruce Walker and the Reagan Institute have marshaled all of the incredible forces within Massachusetts. Brian Anthony has made it possible for us to now test upwards of 2,500, close to 3,000 people a day at MIT for COVID. And incredibly brilliant investigators like Sangeeta Bhatia, Jim Collins, Alex Salik, Arup Chakraborty, and Lydia Buraburi have been able to uh, look at various ways in which we can combat this disease. You'll hear later from Lee Gerke about how basic science can drive rapid antigen testing. It's a very different day. Let's go back to our journey on angina pectoris. Da Vinci in 1504, William Harvey in 1603, great science, nothing happens. Angina pectoris defined in 1801, 1772, but the first diagnosis of a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, is made by this man in 1912. Something that we accept as dogma today is barely 100 years old that the man who presented with chest pain and a COVID infection had a heart attack was only appreciated by this man, James Herrick, who in 1912 published in the Journal of the American Medical Association an article which describes how occluding the branches of the coronary arteries, the arteries that surround the heart, can be occluded and why that would be the case. Now, the truth is, that his work was not accepted for 50 years. It took those angiograms that I showed you for that to occur. So let's just take a little sidetrack because measuring pressures is also part of the world around us. This is a remarkable paper, if not only for the fact that the length of its title stretches from here to here. I'm not gonna even read it, but um, Stephen Hales was a, a minister who actually also inserted catheters, manometers, into the arteries and veins of horses. This man, Werner Forsman, had the idea, based on this, of inserting a catheter into his heart to measure the, uh, the pressures directly. Not made of glass, made of plastic, and not by tying a poor horse down, but by doing it in people. Now, he won the Nobel Prize in 1956, but the truth is, there's a cautionary tale here. Forsman actually petitioned his hospital in 1929, a year after he had graduated medical school, to allow him to do this work. And they were afraid. They were afraid that he would hurt people, and they urged him to do animal experiments, which he did not. He went to the nurse in charge of the um, supplies. He encouraged her to allow him to do this. She wanted him to do this on her. He anesthetized her, he tied her down to a table, and then he inserted the catheter into his own arm vein, threaded it to his heart. She woke up. She was extremely agitated that he had done this. Together they walked to the radiology suite where the radiologist tried to tackle him and pull the catheter out. And he 
subdue them and then had this x-ray taken. Now, he subsequently went on to join the Nazi party. He became the rector of a hospital that operated on Jews and gypsies. And the reason his Nobel Prize was awarded in 1956 is he had to come out of prison for his war crimes before he could get his Nobel Prize. Today, we don't need to do that. Jacob White is going to be sharing with us his remarkable work on very more sophisticated means of cardiac and other forms of imaging which can be hand-worn. Go back to Herrick for a moment. What Herrick did as well is he was a, a visionary, just like Vlad and Brian. He was the first person, head of a major hospital, to put a laboratory in the hospital, insist that his interns, residents, and fellows actually look at body fluids. And it was him, and who his students brought these peculiar looking elongated sickle cells. And he was the first to describe sickle cell anemia because he put a laboratory in a hospital. Today, that laboratory takes on the form of nano and IMS. It looks completely different than those very sterile looking microscopes and test tubes. And it's a degree of sophistication unlike which we've never seen before. Now, sometimes science can interfere with the advancement of medicine. This man, Julius Kohnheim, was one of the most brilliant 19th century pathologists. And he actually wrote that there's no way that clot in coronary arteries could cause heart attacks. Otherwise, everyone would always die because he did, and you can see from the German that I took, he did 30 animal experiments. And every one of those animals would die when he occluded their arteries. Now today, we have, by virtue of IMS, MIT, the Division of Comparative Medicine, and a major internationally renowned animal research laboratory, which is affiliated with our centers, the ability to do things that Kohnheim could never have envisioned. Sophisticated animal experiments from transgenic and various forms of genetically altered animals like mice, rabbits, pigs, and sheep in a setting of the most complex imaging. We can look at arterials and, and other segments in a way that no one could ever have envisioned, staining tissues on a very, very local level for dramatic amounts of material. Chaim Donenberg, for example, has shown that infection and inflammation, just like our patient had, takes you from a realm of a minor response to injury to a dramatic occlusion. Animals that were made transgenic to express uh, an acute phase reactant that is common in infection and inflammation actually go from 20% occlusion after a controlled injury to 80%. 80% of the animals who express this protein will totally occlude their artery. He further went on to show using techniques in IMS and nano that it, on a molecular level, precisely what was going on. Now, Campbell Rogers and Sahil Parikh years ago worked with us to develop those stents that this patient got. They were developed at MIT. Most people don't realize it, but virtually every clinically approved stent in the United States was tested or developed at MIT. And what Campbell and Sahil showed was that by making a good stent, a stent that looks like this from first mechanical principles, you could reduce the amount of injury, you could reduce the amount of clotting, the amount of inflammation, and the amount of hyperplasia. Today, Claire Conway and Jim Squire have used modern computational methods to actually design stents. This is what's going on today in concert with IMS and MIT Nano. And we can actually correlate computational models 
wall stress and actual damage that's induced by a stent to create rules that industry uses to make new devices. We can do this on a much lower level as well. Aditya Kaluri recently showed that you can take the cells from arteries that have stents and have other forms of injury and isolate them on a single cell level. We can actually look at the heat maps that are generated and explicitly um, define what's a smooth muscle cell, what's doing the pumping, what's a fibroblast, what's supporting the artery, and then what are the cells that are actually responding to this profound amount of injury? And then finally, he can actually isolate them on very many levels and explain that they group by virtue of those shear models. Physiologic, physiologic versus non-physiologic domains of stress. High shear stress, physiologic, low shear stress, non-physiologic, and in two repeated experiments, single cell sequencing and computational dynamics allows us to isolate these cells. We have a power today that we never had. Now, when, when uh, Herrick wrote his memoirs in 1949, which isn't that long ago for some of us, he actually wrote as well that his publication in 1912 aroused no interest. It felt like a dud. It wasn't until lantern slides, which were literally slides that had a candle behind them, which were projected on the screen, showed electrocardiograms that physicians in America and later Europe woke up later to become a household word translated by the layman into heart attack. Da Vinci was in 1504. It's not till 1949, 550 years later, that we actually understand what's going on. This man, William Eindhoven, didn't invent, invent the electrocardiogram. He invented the string galvanometer. It allowed us, parenthetically, to record the world around us. It's an extension of an early precursor of what we do. Here's one of the first people getting an electrocardiogram, salt bridges and ceramic jars, uh, and then wires that went to a string galvanometer. And by the way, for those of you who know about the PQRS and T waves, you'll be interested to know that this means nothing other than the fact that figure one started with A, B, C, D, and by the time he got to figure four, he was an O, P, Q, R, S, and T. Today, work that many of us are doing are taking this two-ton string galvanometer and reducing it to a wearable sensor. Wearable sensors sense the world around us. X-rays, parenthetically, were described in the very same year, this remarkable year of 1895. But the remarkable thing I want to tell you is that von Rentgen, who described this, wrote his paper on some kind of rays in 1895, by 1896, it already had impact. Here's Eindhoven, here's von Rentgen. Who said this? This is a really important quote. Professor Rentgen does not draw $1 profit from a discovery. He belongs to those pure scientists who study for pleasure and live to delve into the secrets of nature. After they had discovered something wonderful, someone else must come along to look at it from a commercial point of view. It was Thomas Edison. It was Thomas Edison who, for better or for worse, as terrible a man that he was, actually built the x-ray machines. We need nano, we need MIT nano, because it's not sufficient to do the science. The science has to be translated into something real from the world. One can make the argument that once all of this was in place, x-rays, EKGs, it was a small step to creating those devices that we use to treat my patient. In fact, it wasn't so simple. 
The first stent was proposed by this man, Alexis Carroll in 1912. He too was a somewhat odious person. His name has been removed from many streets in France, though he won the Nobel Prize in 1912. In 1964 and 1969, Charles Dodder and Melvin Dudkins proposed the modern stent. But the truth is, it took remarkable changes in how we not only developed science, but understood scientific, uh, the implications of scientific ideas in the clinic. Today, working with uh, MIT Nano, we are changing how the face of MIT looks. MIT will devote um, and is currently renovating two floors in E25 to a human subjects gateway to allow us to handle HIPAA compliant data and to do human subjects research on the MIT campus. Coupled with the sophisticated way of analyzing tissues, coupled with the sophisticated way of imaging tissues, we can now, and we did then, develop technologies that allowed us to now create coupled devices and to test them in people. Here's a stent. Here's a stent that releases two drugs, rapamycin and paclitaxel, and they are today drugs. This is one of the first drug-eluting stents ever. These two students, who are now very senior investigators, came running in the office one day. Here's a metal stent. Here's the, one of the very first drug-eluting stents. And using confocal microscopy and two-photon microscopy showed that they could deliver drugs with the pattern of their drug eluding platform 200 microns deep into an artery. It was a game changer in the world. So much so that what we've now shown, and these investigations were done at MIT, is that if you have bypass surgery, you're good for about seven years. At one year, only 10% of bypass surgery fails. But bypass surgery means splitting your chest, pulling it apart. In the early days of balloon angioplasty, 40% of patients had failed in a year. When we used metal stents depicted here, 25%. With these drug eluting stents that we helped develop, only 6% of patients will need to come back. So we're back to where we started. We had a patient who had a clot in their artery, an artery that was defined for us in 1504, clot that we should have understood in the middle of the 19th century. But truthfully, it's only the past few hundred years, the past few, a few decades rather, that we've appreciated how this formed. We now know this is a paper from uh, a week ago, that patients with COVID infection have a dramatic increase in the incidence of clotting stents, of clot in multiple vessels, in clots throughout their heart, and in reduced response to intervention. This is the fact that science continues to advance. Let me close by showing you what all of this marriage between MIT Nano and IMS can do. This is one of our COVID patients. There are in this room at least 19 pieces of electronic equipment that are all sending information to us as clinicians. Moreover, we have to go into this room, into the heart of the storm. Now this wonderful depiction by the daughter of one of our MIT alumni shows us what the scope of what MIT has done. First and foremost, we have provided protective equipment for many people throughout New England. In fact, these face shields developed by Marty Culpepper, the stethoscope that we worked on with a company called Think Labs, the collection of masks and gloves and gowns, and even these respirators are all things that MIT investigators supply. And the middle of the COVID crisis, one of every five 
PPEs developed or um, disseminated throughout New England came from MIT. What's more is we've now created and helped companies like Abiomed change the device, this device that that patient got, um, from a device that just resides in the heart to a device that actually gives us signals of what's going on in the heart. This device is an impeller rotor. Here it is a high magnification view of the motor right here. There's an inlet sitting in the major pumping chamber of the heart. It pulls the blood out. And even when the heart is still, we actually can get almost the full amount of cardiac output that Harvey had calculated. Brilliant students like Brian Chang and investigators like Steve Keller have reasoned, if we know how this motor is working, we can actually predict the pressures throughout the heart. And in a recent paper, what they showed is that just by querying motor function, we can precisely track the pressures in the heart to within one millimeter of mercury. 0.93 millimeters of mercury, absolute error. So we live in a remarkable time. We live in a time where we are beset by a disease unlike we, we had ever seen before. And we have reduced in our lifetimes from 1960 to 2010, over the last 50 years, dramatic downturn in diseases because of innovation. It took 500 years to get to that point, but with the work that MIT is doing, both through supporting arms and MIT Nano, hopefully we will exponentially decrease that time. I close by illustrating some support for that idea. Humans in some form or another have been around for anywhere from two to seven million years. Here's the Darwinian descent of man. Well, from Bernowski, Jacob Bernowski made the point that really the human population and society as we understand it has taken this exponential rise in part because Initially, we expected that man dominated nature. We now understand that it is the human understanding of nature. And forgive the use of these pronouns. He wrote this in 1974, and I'm quoting directly from him. The notion of discovering an underlying order in matter is man's basic complex for exploring nature. The architecture of things reveals a structure below the surface, a hidden grain which, when it's laid bare, makes it possible to take natural formations apart and assemble them in a new arrangement. This is what scores of students and postdocs in my laboratory throughout MIT and IMES in concert with uh, MIT Nano funded by organizations like the uh, um, NIH and FDA and in concert with major innovative uh, laboratories like CBSET have allowed us to do and I'm very grateful to Professor Bulovic and Anthony for all they've done for our community and for allowing me to present this plenary today. Thank you. Elazar, thank you very much for the, the inspiring stories and the connections to history. Um, I wanted to, we, please uh, participants, please ask your, your questions via the Q&A function. Uh, Elazar, let me just take the liberty to ask a, a couple questions here. Uh, you're a practicing clinician and an engineer. Um, many of the data that you presented come out of a, a clinical context acquired in the hospital. What needs to happen uh, for the vision that I think many are imagining where the, the sensors that are in our homes, on our person, uh, can be generating data that's actually useful to the caregiver? that they can take it to the hospital. Um, is that, a, is that a, a dream or what, what, what needs to change both from a patient perspective and from a doctor perspective or from a technology perspective to get to the point where we can give our Fitbit, our Apple Watch data to you and for you to do something useful with it? Well, thank you, um, Brian. 
first, I, I will acknowledge that Brian is one of the world leaders in this area. So I'll, I'll say something and then I'll ask him to comment. Uh, I think two things. The two things are the realization that hospitals have now become places for the most ill and oftentimes for end of life. Our responsibility is in realizing that what we are doing is ensuring wellness and health um, at the same time of caring people who are truly ill. The most important thing I think is to realize that engineers like us, scientists like us, clinicians like us, have a responsibility to the community, not simply to the clinic or the hospital. And the most important thing we can do therefore is get all of our technology as quickly as possible out into the general population. That's what we're doing at MIT. That's why we're building and spending huge amounts of money, tens of millions of dollars to allow MIT to do outpatient clinical research. Because frankly, going to the hospital is really arduous. You saw 19 different devices in a patient's room. What we'll soon have is that ability to test individuals who are relatively healthy and just assess wellness. The second thing, which is critical, is that we always talk about this notion of big data. I come from a background of satellite technology. We would have downlinks from 51 different satellites to every two ground stations, every 63.5 microseconds. That's big data. And my uh, medicine doesn't deal with big data, it deals with bad data, spotty data, poor data. We need to find ways of collecting data, registering data, correlating data, filling in bad data, and bringing medical data sciences up to the standard of, say, for example, satellite data sciences. Elazar, thank you for that. And, and one, one more question, um, and then we'll, We'll take your words and we'll, we'll enjoy the rest of the day. Um, because of COVID and because of the, our, our modern era, is it easier or harder to do this translation, to get the technology that needs to be developed and, and validated and tested, translated out into the world? Is, are, there, are the barriers or the impediments to doing that translational innovations? Um, where does the ecosystem stand to try to accelerate the, that deployment of these technologies that are needed to improve healthcare? Well, I am naturally an optimist. I'm actually a hyper-optimist. For me, the glass is 99% full always. One of the remarkable things that always happens with crises is that they stimulate medical advances. Most of surgery arose in the setting of wars, revolutionary wars, civil war, the world wars, they actually are big blips upward in advances in surgical medicine. What's happened, at least in my domain space within the COVID crisis, is a remarkable marshalling of resources, everything from providing new ways of protecting people to new ways of diagnosing people. Hospitals and places like MIT have realized that they are codependent and they established pathways for not only communicating, but sharing good ideas. I think from my vantage point, there has been a remarkable coming together of our both community of scholars and community of friends, especially at MIT, to do things for the common good. I've been quoted often for the statement I made at a faculty meeting is, that this is exactly what MIT was designed to do, to harness science, technology, and engineering to improve the human condition. And I think we have done it. The idea of fostering translation means that we actually identify a need and then act carefully, safely, to study efficacy in its domain. And I think we've done that, and I, I, I look forward to even more of that and to the rest of today.